Excellent. So, so thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, as mentioned, I was involved with the, the, the early hall system, and I was a, a theorem-proving, deductive theorem-proving, interactive theorem-proving hacker for 15 years uh, in, Mike's, uh, in Mike's group in Cambridge, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, flew around the world with a suitcase full of uh, plastic uh, overhead transparencies teaching hall to, to industry and, and, uh, and other places. Uh, and at that time, my sort of application interest was in, in hardware verification. Um, and um, I, think, I think after about 15 years of that, I, I kind of I took a sabbatical, which is still going on from, from theorem proving, um, and, and switched area and, and got interested in uh, industrial um, hardware, hardware verification. I kind of changed technology. And so it's that kind of next 15-year uh, period of my, my work that I want to speak about today because they asked me to say something about industrial application of proof, right? And this is the best thing I know um, personally about, about that area. So it's just a little bit of my experience with, uh, with chip design verification. So here's, a, here's, a, here's the Intel Core i7, uh, sort of a slightly old uh, version. Um, but this is a modern microprocessor, um, probably one of the most complicated arf artifacts ever created by humans. Uh, extremely challenging to design, extremely challenging to design in a bug-free and correct fashion. Uh, but nonetheless, they, they come out regularly and, uh, and they work, and, uh, and that's uh, largely due to the skill of engineers and, and physicists who, who make these things operate. Uh, but they are very difficult to design and also very hard to get right. And here's, here's a picture of the Pentium uh, processor um, and uh, obligatory sort of mention of Intel's famous FDIF bug um, in the mid-1990s. Uh, where the floating point division um, algorithm was incorrectly implemented um, on, on the, the floating point unit of that, of that chip. Um, and that was a huge potential cost to, to Intel at the time, and a kind of wake-up call to the industry to say that uh, you know, these bugs can be, can be very, very expensive and a sort of, sort of strategic uh, problem for, um, for the semiconductor industry. Um, and that's about the time that I, I kind of started to get, get involved with... Um, with um, industrial commercial microprocessor verification. So I'm going to go back in time again. Um, this is a um, proceedings of the first conference I've ever, ever attended. Uh, and uh, and uh, back then, in 1985, um, there were a few of us um, interested in formal chip design verification. Um, in, in, in semiconductor um, industry, they, they use the word formal verification to mean formal, formal chip design verification. There's other forms of verification. Uh, but at that time, formal verification seemed a, vain, a sort of vain dream uh, by only a few bold pioneers. Uh, with the conf the conf this conference, there were very few people from industry, and they were pretty skeptical about, about what uh, could be done. But nonetheless, there are some of the leaders of our field uh, were there producing some of the se seminal kind of theoretical work and, uh, and ideas, conceptual work for, for formal verification. Um, that was the beginning, and we were all there at the beginning. Uh, and. Uh, if we advance now to 2009, there was this terrific paper that came out uh, about uh, replacing testing, simulation testing, entirely uh, with formal verification for the whole core i7 execution cluster uh, on the chip. Now, the execution cluster is the part that does the floating point calculation, does the integer calculation, does all the numerical um, calculation and, and, and simpler things like shift and so on. Um, so this was the full data path control and state validation of the entire i7 execution cluster. Absolutely, I think this is a, a huge success of our, collectively, our, our area in formal verification. It should be really a better known paper. Um, and and it, this has essentially replaced simulation in that, in that unit of the chip. Um, and, and took them a big effort. If you read, read the paper, you see that they had 30 person years effort in doing that verification, a lot of people involved, uh, but nonetheless gave great confidence in the, in the result there. So I want to just sort of trace some of that technology back to the beginning. So back in, in 1985, uh, Randy Bryant um, had this great idea, right, of, of, of treating, uh, of looking at logic simulators and sort of formalizing the algorithms that, uh, formalizing the methods by which simulators, you know, binary simulators of chip, chip circuitry were, was, was done and, and putting it into the formal kind of symbolic realm. Um, and uh, in, again, back in, in this proceedings, he had a, he had a paper that said, can a simulator verify a circuit? In other words, can we use a simulator, which we all used to sort of disparage as incomplete, and they are incomplete, uh, can we use a simulator to, to fully verify or get complete verification? And of course, we can through symbolic simulation, and that's where the roots of this technology uh, came from. 
And that eventually led to a, a formulation of a, of a logic and a method called uh, symbolic trajectory evaluation, uh, which is the basis of the, the tool that Intel used to, to do the I-7 verification and the work that I was involved in in my kind of second career after theorem proving uh, with Intel. So symbolic tra trajectory evaluation is a, is a very simple form of linear time, bounded linear time temporal logic uh, with, with implications that look like this. A leads to C, where A is a, what we call the antecedent, which is a kind of circuit stimulus. Say, so, well, if the circuit is stimulated in this way, then after a while, this response that satisfies the property C will, will be observed. Right? It's a kind of stimulus response logic. A very simple uh, syntax of formulas. You can say a circuit node has a zero on it. You can say it has a one on it. You can, you can join those things. You can move forward a step in time. And you can have these guarded formulas that I'll talk about in a minute. So put zeros and ones all over the place in the circuit, simulate, and then make an observation. That's, that's symbolic trajectory evaluation. So it's more than that, really, because it combined two good ideas here uh, on top of the notion of just forward simulation of the circuit design. One is ternary simulation, so simulation with uh, an unknown value x as, as well as the zeros and ones. So um, there's a little information ordering here with x at the bottom. If you have an x on your circuit node, what that means is you don't know whether it's a zero or a one. You have no knowledge about that. It doesn't mean a don't care, by the way. So you're not allowed to kind of say, well, I'm going to make it one then, right? Um, it's, you have no knowledge. It is something, but you don't know what that is. Uh, and then regular zeros and ones. So ternary simulation is a very important um, element to this technology. And the great thing about this is that you can exploit essentially um, la laziness in the internal circuitry of the design. So if you have an X that's coming in, don't know, but you reach a sort of AND gate here and there's a zero on one side of the AND gate, that's going to be determined, okay, even in the absence of knowledge about what the other input. So this is an abstraction mechanism that allows you to step away from certain knowledge about circuit uh, node values. And then the, the second good idea is symbolic simulation. So there's a, a little circuit design, and symbolic simulation operates by putting variables into the circuit and then doing a forwards circuit simulation and producing expressions at the end. These could be uh, and, and inverter graphs or expressions of, uh, or represented by BDDs or formulas or what have you. So symbolic simulation plus ternary, ternary simulation was really the secret sauce to symbolic trajectory evaluation. evaluation. Uh, so what these things, two things do uh, to, to combine is to give you a Gawa connection, uh, a state space abstraction, uh, the Boolean abstraction, um, sometimes called, uh, where you can discard information about the sets of states that you're manipulating in the, in, as you're doing a simulation through the circuit design. Um, and in STE, in this symbolic trajectory evaluation, evaluation, that abstraction is driven by the specification. So if the specification declines to mention what a circuit node's value is, that circuit node gets a value X, and that introduces an unknown into the system, and, and then you're doing this abstraction. You're abstracting away from the values inside. I want to return to these little guard expressions that, we ha that I showed you in the formulas. Um, the guard expressions are, uh, and, 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 and to really understand the symbolic trajectory evaluation, you really have to understand that this is the guard expressions. The guard expressions are a symbolic layer above the la layer of uh, three-level, three-value concrete simulation. So we've got these three-valued simulations going on, zeros, ones, and x's, and the guards introduce a kind of symbolic layer on top, which is essentially a, an elaborate form of indexing families of concrete simulations. It's a two-level system, okay? So it's a symbolic layer on top of the, the abstractions. It's really a partitioned abstraction mechanism. Um, so here's, here are a couple of SCE verifications, then AND gate, um, if the input A is zero, then the output should be zero. Or if the input B is zero, the output should be zero. Those are two properties you might prove. But you can combine those into a, an all singing, all dancing family of properties by introducing a variable B that controls which of those inputs is getting zero. So if V is true, you're going to look, look at this case. And if V is false, you're going to look at this case. And that's a symbolic layer that's, as it were, um, just, just enumerating the individual simulations that you're doing at a kind of concrete level. So the result is a system of partitioned abstractions. Um, so here's another, so you're the only cir comp circuit you're going to see is an AND gate in this talk, right? Here's another AND gate, um, ABC. And so, you know, ordinary simulation, you've got eight possible input patterns to check here. Uh, and there they are. Uh, but um, with 
with symbolic trajectory evaluation, you can represent a group of those, those input patterns with an abstraction here. And this <coughs> a blob uh, represents the patterns um, in which A is zero, and B and C can be anything, okay? So that's one kind of abstract case. That's an abstraction of four concrete cases. Loss of information about what's on B and C. Uh, likewise, there's another collection here in which the middle wire B is, is zero. We don't care about the other two because the output's determined, right? So really we have um, four, three, four cases here, three in which one of the inputs is zero and one in which they're all, all ones, okay? And those are, the real, those are the three abstract cases we have to check. So abstraction, um, four cases abstracted to, to one with loss of information. Um, and then on top of this, you take these four cases and represent them with an indexed collection of, a symbolically indexed collection of properties um, in the way I, I described with the, uh, with the little variable v. So you take all four cases and you combine them symbolically with Boolean variables to produce a symbolic representation of all four cases simultaneously. And that's your antecedent to the property you're checking, okay? And that's the thing that, that gets pushed through. That's the state, the state space representation that gets pushed through the simulation as you're doing, as you're doing the simulation. So this combines abstraction with uh, essentially the exploitation of symmetry because if the representation of the different cases that you're constructing has some kind of symmetry in it, that can be a huge win in terms of the, the computer representations of the, of the states. Um, and in particular, we, we relied on BDDs, okay, uh, where we could get that symmetry to just wash out in the sharing inside the BDDs. And so you could, com you could com very, very um, effectively compress, uh, compress many cases into one. So things which, which were, were exponen exponential could be, could be represented with a kind of linear, um, a linear checkable formula with, um, with exploitation of the symmetry. It doesn't work that well, that as w quite as well with SAT, right? Because symmetry and SAT are not really good friends um, sort of natively, but, but um, you know, you, there's some things you can do. Um, and this particular piece of technology is just what you need <coughs> for complex data path circuit verification. So things like floating point divide, floating point multiply, and so on. Okay, so this was all wrapped up in a tool. Um, this is the second major tool I had privilege to, to uh, make a contribution to um, after Hall, uh, Intel's Forte tool, uh, and it had a lot of major successes in, in the data path um, space and industry. Um, and this tool was an all, the, you know, really the brainchild of, of, of Carl uh, Seeger there, um, really had, had everything in it. It had the, had the symbolic property logic, symbolic simulation, abstraction, SAT, BDDs. It actually was a whole functional programming environment in the syntax of classic ML. Um, in fact, but lazy, um, so, it, so it had its own complete language, a functional programming language. Um, it, had, it had a theorem prover, a deductive theorem prover, which was a clone of Hall Light and Hall. I worked on the pre-logic for that, and that was really exciting, right? And so it was really great to be doing pre-logic <laughs> functions, you know, for this new theorem prover, um, bringing me back to my, my previous fun with Hall. Um, so it had a theorem prover for combining properties and, and many other things. Uh, and this was an absolute terrific tool, which... Uh, which uh, worked very well. Now, we, um, <coughs> one of the things that I got quite a bit involved with when I, when I worked with Intel on this technology was the tool, but also what we call the methodology, okay, for using the tool. And methodology sounds kind of weak, right, as a kind of, well, what is that, right? But I came to respect the understanding of methodology, and I'm very interested in some of the other talks today that talk about getting formal into industry, because I think this is a key element in actually making it really, really work in practice is having a, a handle on the methodology. So we devised a, um, a, uh, uh, a specific methodology around the Forte tool. Uh, by methodology, we meant a systematic and pragmatic approach to organizing the, the verification efforts and structuring them in such a way that they, they deliver um, on the verification needs. And this, I can't emphasize enough how important this was in terms of actually getting this stuff adopted across the company. Um, so we have some papers on the explicit principles that we devised for this, this technology. I'm not going to take you through them, but I'm going to pick one, one, for example, realistic. Your, your, your methodology has to be realistic. So if your verification methodology is first ask the chip design architect for a complete specification of what the thing's supposed to do, and then start typing tactics, right? 
Um, that is not realistic, okay? Because that specification is not going to be there. It's going to be spread across whiteboards and in people's minds and in some documents that are probably out of date and so on. So you have to understand how things really operate. Um, that's not to say that you can't try and be disruptive a little bit to the way engineers actually practice their engineering. But if it requires you to completely up, you know, make a complete upheaval to, to, to that, then you're not really going to get going unless you can, you know, really come in with a, a, new, a, new, a new chip design company or something. So we had a methodology that went around with that. And then when I, when I um, thought about this, I thought, well, wait a minute. What we've, we've had this big success with, with chip verification. What are the key drivers of progress there? Um, so there's simulation back there, and, um, and that's us in the formal car at the front. And uh, really, there were four things. Algorithms. So when, when BDDs came along, that was a complete revolution. When SAT, when an efficient SAT came along, that was a total revolution. Um, SMT came along. The revolution's under, underway, I suppose, right? We're, um, we're waiting still. Um, good abstractions, and not just the, the general theory of abstraction, which, which it, you know, there's a Galois connection for SDE, and there's an abstraction theory there, and so on, but specific ex abstractions that work for specific things to verify. You know, we all know, we all know, for example, now what the abstractions are for a floating point addition, big, big floating point. We know what those are. So. Methodology, as I mentioned. And then I think we always forget Moore's Law, right? So Moore's Law has just floated everyone's boats, right? So machine learning, it floated machine learning's boat, it floated the formal verification boat. There's so much more we can do now that we have so much more computing power uh, available. So just a word about... Um, about formal verification in practice, right? How do you get this to go in practice? What's it really like? What does it feel like to do? Um, so you start with a field of problems, 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 problems everywhere, right? Uh, and the, the verification problems, verification challenges. Um, so if you've got a tool, your, your tool will, you know, out of the box, you know, solve some of the problems for you, right? And that's great. So the so by definition, the problems that the tool can solve aren't problems right, um, at all, right? But, but you know, they, they will do some things for you al al already. I mean, an extremely valuable thing for a formal um, chip design verification tool to do nowadays at system on chip level is check whether everything's connected to each, to, to each other correctly, right? It's actually not that, you know, that, that can be done automat automatically. That can save money and time, right? So there are some simple problems you can solve just with the tool. Uh, and then with the tool and the methodology, you can do better because um, then you, you, you're not reinventing things every time. You've got a guiding principle for how you carry things out. And that's well, what I would call the re region of productivity for, for the, the, the verification engineers with a bachelor's degree just starting. They can be productive with a tool and a methodology and get, and get some results. The region I've been fascinated by w since I started this is what I call the region of innovation. Okay. And that's where just the tool and the methodology kind of straightforwardly applied is not going to get you anywhere. Um, where you've got problems that just don't get tackled by that. And that's where you have to innovate in terms of how the formal verification is applied to the problem. How do you decompose the problem? How do you find the right abstraction? How do you take a different point at, point at it? Uh, how, you know, maybe there'll be some technology development. Um, these are all problems where, where you have to do some innovation. And this is, you know, this is, this region here is the what some people call totally automatic, right, tool, okay? Outside this, nothing's totally automatic, okay? You've got a tool that's mechanized and it's, it's, it's running, right? But you need <laughs> to think, right? And you need to do things carefully and well. Uh, over time, of course, the tool and the methodology start to encompass that region of innovation once you've understood how to do it. Um, but uh, that's, that's a great thing. So life in the region of innovation, you tackle problems where traditional methods fail, and really what you need there is an experience and an intellectual toolkit to understand the structure of the problem and, and innovate your way to a, to a solution. Um, an example is system on chip formal verification, which is kind of happening now, right? Um, this is operates at a lar much larger scale than ordinary block level formal chip design verification um, and uh, focuses mostly on how the blocks kind of participate in a, in a collaborative dance to produce uh, you know, to play your, your MP3 while you're on the phone or whatever it is in a, in a system on chip. And so it's a, it's a different area, and it's an area that's, uh, that's, that's being tackled now, and it's an area where innovation is required, really, to get, uh, to get results. 
Um, there are roadblocks in system on chip and roadblocks in any area of innovation. Applicability, um, you know, is the tool, does the tool fit that area? As the tool capacity is always a problem for any formal verification tool. Set up for verification, how much time do you have to spend kind of just getting it kind of wrapped up so that you can use it? Um, expertise, does anyone know how to use the tool? Um, and for each of these things, there are ways of attacking them, but they require ingenuity and innovation. So for capacity checking, you, you do the typical computer science things of divide and conquer and so on. Um, for complexity, you, you have all kinds of hacks, formal hacks to, to, to push uh, complex um, logic through, through a tool. And for setup and expertise, that's again, developing a kind of best known method or a, a methodology for, for carrying out the problem. <coughs> so that's, that's the region of innovation. And a big question in, in the companies that I work with is always, but, but do we have to hire people with PhDs to do this, right? Because um, they, you know, they, they prefer to not do that, right? Because, because we are not producing enough PhDs, right, who can do this. And, uh, and uh, you know, they're maybe they're, they're hard to acquire. Uh, so does it need a PhD? Well, from, from the Forte tool, um, the answer was at the beginning, yes. So here's the, here's the, the introductory paper about Forte that we published uh, back in 2005. And basically, 100% of the authors have a PhD on that paper. Right? Yes. Um, the I7 paper, only 25% of the more authors on that, on that paper have a PhD. Uh, the lead author, Rope, has got two PhDs, I should say. <laughs> but, but, um, <coughs> so, so I'm not sure if I counted that, but, but uh, you know, so, so the, the maturity of the technology is such that, you know, you can have people who haven't done a PhD in formal verification be effective and, and help in a team and, and produce, produce the results. Um, what about no PhDs, uh, well, there, there are uses of symbolic trajectory evaluation across, across Intel um, the departments and, 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 and units where, where the people are very smart. I don't mean to say that they're not, they're not you know, smart and skilled engineers, but they haven't trained at doctoral level in the application of proof to, to chip design. So you can be productive once you kind of get the knack of how to do it. Uh, and it's really down to, to developing effective methodologies. What about the region of research? This is a bigger region. So these regions are always kind of, you know, being, you know, expanding and being occupied. So what was innovation, what was a sort of research yesterday is now innovation and then becomes a eventually incorporated in the tool. So there's a region of research out there and that's where another nice place to be. Um, the region, for me, the region of research in, in, the m in, circuit level uh, microelectronic ver verification is becoming less academically um, sort of what they're rewarding <coughs> than, than moving on to, a, to another problem. Because uh, there's, there's a huge amount, I mean, there's still research problems to, to be happening, to be done there. There's still very good fundamental work to be happening. There's still a community of people doing that. Um, but after, after 15 years in, in sort of uh, microarchitecture verification of, of the chip level designs, uh, my own work, my own research has moved away from that area. Um, I'm still doing um, impact stuff in this, in this area, and quite a bit of impact stuff, and there'll still, still be some, some research elements in there, that area. But I want to move on to the next frontier uh, for this. Um, and that's, of course, software, um, <laughs> software verification. So a much bigger problem, a much harder problem, and several topics, uh, several speakers today will be speaking and telling us uh, very interesting things about software verification. Um, I don't want to tackle <coughs> the software problem, you know, per se. I want to find a niche within the software verification problem where, where I'm comfortable and where I can, um, where I think I can get some results. And so this is the sort of current work that I'm, I'm doing now with colleagues. Uh, and we're focusing on embedded software. Okay, so the, the kind of software that's baked into your, into your the chips inside here and your, your, your wireless uh, the box at home and, and so on. This, we, we do know that this will be a great pain point for systems design. Um, it's a very diverse application area and uh, very hard. Um, and it's unclear exactly how anyone's going to make money off this, um, in the, certainly in the EDA space, how companies are going to make money. But I think it will come, and I think models are starting to emerge where, where money can, can, be, can be made on this. Um, but there's no really established methodology for formal ver verification at low level. I mean, really established methodology. There are research papers, yes, but there's no established way of attacking this. And kind of, it's you know, maybe people will disagree, but 
Um, so we're looking not just at uh, embedded uh, software, but we're trying to look at sort of the lowest level of firmware, okay, um, that, that there is in, in devices. Um, it's everywhere, and it's going to be even more everywhere when, when the Internet of Things really takes off. Um, it's already there. So our working definition of, of firmware is software code that's distributed and stored inside the product, essential for its function, hidden from the end user, and intimately entangled with the hardware. So I, I love hardware so much that I'm not completely walking away from it. I'm, I'm looking at the software, uh, the very lowest levels of software, not microcode, by the way. Um, I don't want to do microcode verification, but the, but the lowest levels of software that are intimately connected with the hardware. And down there, you have weird behavior, like when you, like you can read, you know, when you read a, a variable, you know, it destroys the value, right? Or you're not allowed to write this variable until you've written that one, or, um, you know, and so on, right? So there, there are many um, hardware-dependent semantics of the software at that level. Um, and this is a growing paradigm and a difficult thing to do in, in industry, and they're very interested in it. So uh, after 15 years of, um, of uh, microarchitecture verification, uh, we, we launched, a, I, I got involved in a project for the va validation of low-level firmware um, with this, this uh, fantastic team of, of international collaborators. We really got a big kickstart from a, um, um, a grant from in Intel Corporation to spend uh, three years work, working on this in a collaborative way and um, getting our hands dirty with, uh, with low-level firmware verification. And that was a number of years ago. Um, so 2010 is when that project started. Um, and since then, uh, we've, been, we've been running a number of projects with some of them funded by the Semiconductor Research Corporation. So this is still in the chip, chip design space, but looking at low-level um, hardware software systems, firmware, and, and verification of those. And I've kind of switched tools, right? So the work that all of this has been based on is, is uh, Daniel Koning's CBMC tool. So that's my third kind of major tool that I'm that I'm now getting my hands very dirty with and, and, and using in our, in our research here. And so Forte is, is, is there in industry and still used, but, but for this we're, we're using uh, CBMC, which I, I guess people know is a, is a bounded model checker for C programs, right? And that's the, the tool we're using for this hardware software verification. Um, I'm finished. Am I finished early? Okay.